In Arlen, Texas, there lives a hero who deals in propane and propane accessories, a true American role model for the middle class. But could Hank Hill make it through the apocalypse and learn to survive in the wasteland? That's what we'll be figuring out today. Can you beat Fallout 4 as Hank Hill? The rules are simple. I can only use the flamer and shish kebab as weapons, and I can only wear the undershirt and jeans. And with that being said, let's jump into the run. Our story begins with the most relatable anime protagonist being created and then losing our clothes. <laughs> uh, I look like a jackass. We stop by the Drumlin Diner and somehow get involved in a shootout over the shop owner's son not paying for his medicine. But between Patrick and Trudy, they chase off the solicitors and Hank is free to continue his journey. After seeing just how whacked out the world has gotten, we stop by the Cambridge police station to watch a true American hero fight off a horde of unruly hooligans. After taking everything inside the police station as payment for a job well done, Diamond City was the next stop. Dealing with the locals here is always a question of how weird can Fallout make normal interactions and this time was no different. Hank waited until morning for the clothes shop to open to finally finish off his outfit and then Piper and the mayor started talking to him. Except, instead of being in close proximity, Piper was near the entrance, Hank was in the middle of Diamond City, and the mayor was by the scoreboard. For anyone watching this interaction, we would have been basically yelling as loud as we could to carry on this conversation, and it went on for long enough that a security guard had to check in on us. Once Hank stopped getting yelled at, he visited Becky Fallon, Diamond City's clothes store. But after watching her restock her items for nearly a week, she never had Hank's signature look, so he went back to Patrick at the diner and borrowed a set of clothes off him. He's a nice kid. After finally having clothes, he stopped by Good Neighbor, and this is where the real problem of the run began to show itself. The vendors that were supposed to sell flamer fuel didn't until a certain level, meaning Hank couldn't stock up before going and getting one of the only two weapons he was allowed to use. So that just meant that after picking up the flamer from the castle, he would have to ration his ammo and pick his fights carefully. Or that's what would have been the smart option, but between the Mirelurks and the low base damage the flamer had, he didn't make it out with very much ammo. So the first order of business was outfitting the flamer with Strickland propane to make sure it could deal with enemies later on, and surprisingly, you don't need any perks to add all the attachments. So as long as he kept visiting Percy in Diamond City, he could get all the materials to actually make a decent weapon. But with no ammo, it still wasn't that useful. That's okay, there's supposed to be two cans of ammo in Mass Bay Medical. Only issue is, between the gunners attacking and the multiple levels of this place, Hank never stayed alive long enough to find the damn things. But luckily, there was a place where he could stock up on ammo and grab the second weapon of the run. However, Hank didn't have near enough firepower to deal with these guys. But he did manage to run in and grab one of the cans of ammo to at least get the ball rolling. Hopefully it's enough to do some quests with and gain some experience. While trying to think of the next plan, he overheard a voice from a fridge. After opening it up, Hank was introduced to Billy, a ghoul boy looking for his parents. It may not be Bobby, but Billy is just as disappointing, so naturally he was allowed to travel with him. But seeing as Billy wanted us to go in the opposite direction for his quest, Hank took a small detour and instead went to go save Nick first. This was only going to take a second. Uh, that boy ain't right. Thankfully, the Triggerman went down as fast as you'd expect the person who was recently set on fire to, and as long as he didn't hand out free samples like Costco did, Hank figured he'd have enough ammo, and enough warmth to make it through the hideout. Hank was able to save Nick after giving him his own personal barbecue, and then let him do all the shooting as they walked to Skinny Malone. And surprisingly, with Hank's low charisma, they were able to talk their way out of the final fight, which is awesome as he was out of ammo by this point. But now with them safe, Hank had no idea how he was going to deal with later quests if he couldn't actually use his weapon. Luckily, the friendly neighborhood bait dealer Cricket sells flamer ammo at any level. This woman is a godsend. Now with some ammo, it was time to show Bobby 2.0 that you can fight fire with fire. Let's go, Bobby. We're done with this jackass festival. However, Hank Hill wasn't invincible, and when he ran into Slag, he was quickly reminded how little defense he had against fire. But he had something that Slag didn't. The pure burning flame of propane. But Hank was able to grab the shish kebab off him after their fight, so now he was finally kitted out for the rest of the run.
Now with everything sorted, he went and talked to Nick Valentine to move on to the next quest and track down Kellogg. And thankfully, he sat in the right chair this time. Uh, howdy, Con. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Here you go. I thought you might enjoy 7.5 gallons of pure premium propane. Are you kidding? No, I cook with mesquite. Give meat a nice taste of wood. And I cook with propane. Gives meat a nice taste of meat. After leaving on a disagreement, Hank went and borrowed a key to get into Kellogg's house to continue the quest. On the road to hunt down Kellogg, Hank had to show a couple of locals the benefit of grilling with propane, and some charcoal users decided to show Bobby's replacement what happens when you don't have your dad to protect you. After saving Hank's adopted son and making it to Fort Hagen, the sins inside didn't fare much better against the souped-up flamer. The only thing here that was worrisome was the lack of defense against laser weapons. But with enough stim packs, dying wasn't ever an issue. And then the face-off with Kellogg happened, and man, Hank was pissed. Please, Mr. Hill, loud is not allowed. What the? Loud is not allowed? Now you listen to me, mister. I work for a living. And I mean real work, not writing down gobbledygook. I provide the people of this community with propane and propane accessories. Oh, when I think of all my hard-earned tax dollars going to pay a bunch of little twig boy bureaucrats like you, it just makes me want to... With Kellogg dismantled in his brain in Hank's pocket, he headed over to Dr. Amari to dive through the brains and learn about teleportation. Now it was time to head out into the glowing sea to speak with Virgil. On the way, we watched the Brotherhood of Steel fight some super mutants, and this was the perfect opportunity to give Bobby 2.0 a role model to look up to. I think you need a role model, Bobby. Someone to emulate, a hero. Someone besides that broccoli neck. Ah, oh, dang it, Bobby. After that failed attempt at father-son bonding time, they made it to the children of Adam to learn where Virgil was. Excuse me, are y'all with the cult? We're not a cult. We're an organization that promotes love and... Yeah, this is it. They tracked down Virgil, and he told them about hunting down a chorister to learn about other types of cooking. But for anyone who doesn't use propane... We ask them politely yet firmly to leave. Pretend to be broke, but I got hella cash. If you use charcoal, I'ma kick your ass. The coarser fight went about as expected, a disorderly middle-aged man with a fire sword fighting a ghostly apparition. Classic Fallout stuff. With the chip in hand, Hank ran to the railroad and got them to decipher the chip. For trying to help tons of synths, they sure don't have any defenses in the case they were attacked. It's not foreshadowing or anything, just an observation. I lied! It's foreshadowing! With the chip decoded, Hank made it back to Virgil to retrieve the plans for the teleporter, and now he could pick a faction to side with. The Brotherhood of Steel seemed like the right choice, as they were the most American faction Hank could think of. Yes, I know all of these factions are in America, but soldiers in giant suits of armor scream freedom to me. To earn his place in their ranks, Hank had to travel to Arcjet Systems with Dan to recover some pre-war tech. Long story short, the synths were no match for good old-fashioned American propane, but jet fuel can also deal some damage. That's a clean burning hell, I tell you what. <laughs> After the success of the mission, Hank Hill was flown up to the Magic Sky Blimp and got his induction into the Brotherhood of Steel. Now that Hank was officially a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, he was tasked with clearing out Fort Strong. Super mutants burn just like any other enemy, but the behemoth was another story. He took out the smaller super mutants outside and inside the fort, and had to smoke some of that inferior tobacco to finally take down the behemoth. After reporting back to Elder Maxon, he gave him permission to start construction on the teleporter to get inside the institute. Since Hank is a handyman, he had all the pieces to build it straight away and make it inside. Hank was guided through the institute by some kind of sad Walt Disney, and then saw his son further in. Then Father came and tried to talk to him about some sciencey science. I can't tell him that, because it's not up to me. There's a Buddhist saying, As the wheel follows the ox that draws the cart, the wind cannot overturn a mountain. You're talking like a song from the Lion King. Stop that, it makes no sense. Or does it make perfect sense? What the... See, that's the type of... I'm gonna kick your ass. Seeing Hank was confused, Father allowed him to tour the Institute and meet up with various scientists, even one that the Brotherhood had an interest in. 
Dr. Lee was needed to help the Brotherhood with the super secret project. So are you Chinese or Japanese? But she wouldn't aid us until Hank got her the info that her organization she worked for was secretly teaching people that propane was an inferior heating source. Once she heard the news, she dropped everything and began to work for us. Good old American exploitation. With his new scientist friend, work could finally begin on Liberty Prime, our favorite communist hating robot. And what do you think the first thing he had to build was? If you guessed magnets, you are correct. Luckily, Hank had purchased some from Diamond City, so this only took a second. Next came sourcing weapons for Liberty Prime in the form of giant throwable nukes, everyone's first form of offense when building a super robot. Finding the weapon silo was pretty straightforward, and navigating through the underground tunnels was just another Sunday afternoon after church. All that was missing was the apron that said kiss the cook. Further inside, he met with another cult member, and he was able to convince him that the nukes were going to be used for reasons, and that was good enough for them to give him the key to the base. Hank reported back to get another praise from Elder Maxon, and instead he got yelled at because Dan's was a surprise communist. What? Communist? Naturally, he wasn't allowed to live, so Hank was now on the hook to take care of the traitor's behavior. Last time something scary was shown on screen, I used sloths, but otters were requested this time. After dealing with Dan's, Hank took a trip to space via Deathclaw Airlines to get back to Elder Max and quicker. He was pleased at the speed of the mission, and now instead of killing one traitor, Hank had to go deal with an entire organization. I keep that thing on me. God damn it, Bobby. They see me selling propane, and now they trying to copy. Hank Hill could take on God if he was asked to, so of course he put an end to their no-gooding. With one of the two obstacles out of the way, the only thing left for the Brotherhood to deal was to secure a super battery to power our giant ace card. But let's be honest, when you send Brotherhood knights and a local pissed off father with a flaming sword in to secure something, there's nothing that can actually stop you. With all of the pieces in hand, Hank now had to do the easiest escort mission in the history of gaming. Hank didn't get why you'd send in small sins to fight something that could throw enough explosives to level a small town, but he's not complaining as that big something was on his side. Liberty Prime walked them to the Institute, and then the Brotherhood and Hank got the work, inviting all of the synths to the local barbecue. Even Father got an invitation. After getting the local party ready, they set the Institute to blow, as this was a sin against propane and propane accessories. They teleported out and set the place to blow, ending the run and solidifying Hank Hill as a survivor of the Wasteland. Who would have guessed that the Pinnacle Texan would find a way to pursue his propane needs in the Wasteland? All in all, this run offered up a nice challenge, and I'm keen to do another character like this in the future. If you liked what you saw, please consider subscribing as it helps the channel out a ton. Plus, if you have a suggestion for a challenge run you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. I'll play all sorts of games, so no challenges off the table. I want to thank all of you that watched to this point, and as always, I have been Chris from Crisis Gaming, and I will see you on the next one.